welcome to our summer series of India Now. My name is Avani Dias and this is a look back on some of the issues that have dominated the news and society here in India. School textbooks can be a divisive issue across the world. Here in India, the national government is being accused of rewriting history to suit its political and religious agenda and removing key details from textbooks. Why was Mahatma Gandhi killed? What were the 2002 Gujarat riots? What is evolution? For students in India now, these pretty key questions may no longer be answered in your textbook. I haven't heard of uh, history chapters being removed uh, before this and I've been teaching from 1981. Now the books no longer mention that Nathuram Godse, the man who killed Gandhi, had ties to Hindu extremists. Or that the 2002 Gujarat riots under Narendra Modi as chief minister ever happened. Now those riots killed at least a thousand people, most of them Muslims. So we decided to look at 21 textbooks of social science from grades 6 to 12, given that the uh, party in power, that's the BJP, that it has been in controversy even in the past for changes made to social science textbooks. There seem to be a lot of changes, deletions pertaining to events in contemporary Indian histories. We saw a lot of deletions made with regard to democracy. There were many changes pertaining to uh, caste and discrimination. So there are three detailed references to the Gujarat riots. What happened as part of the exercise last year was that two of those three references, events leading up to the riots and what happened after that, have been dropped. When the NCRT reprinted the textbooks with all of these changes, we noticed that the, the lone surviving reference to the Gujarat riots had also been dropped. So with that, we don't really have any de detailed reference to the Gujarat riots in the N NCRT social sciences textbooks anymore. Another thing that jumped out for us was Gandhi's difficult relationship with in Hindu extremists. They have dropped references or sentences on his difficult relationship with the Hindu extremists, how they hated his idea of a secular India, that India should be for Hindus and Muslims, and the extremists, on the other hand, envision India as a country for Hindus. And as for evolution, more than 1,800 people from India's scientific community have demanded that the theory of evolution be reinstated in textbooks for years 9 and 10. 250 academics and historians have objected to the deletions in history and sociology, including deletions of Muslim history and social revolutions. This is exactly what the Bharti Janata Party and RSS want. They want to remove all Muslim presence from Indian imagination and that is why history is very important for them but similarly they also want democracy to be known as a procedural thing in which citizens only vote and therefore they don't want the children to talk about social movements or protest movements which give citizens their agency. India's Hindutva leaders have been on a mission to end what they call the glorification of invaders. Leaders of Kat dispensation have been talking about a lot, you know, the need to correct history, to restore some kind of a balance. Towards that end, it seemed like a lot of traditions had been made pertaining to chapters on Mughals and Muslim rulers of India. There have been three rounds of changes to the NCRT textbooks since 2014. Why this exercise is making news is because it just stands out in terms of the scale of changes that have been made. Some of these changes are sweeping, there are chapters that have been dropped. The Mughals, Muslim conquerors from Central Asia, ruled India a hundred years longer than the British, and there have been deep cuts to the chapters about them. In 1700, in fact, we have a, a, the Mughal Empire controls 25% of the world's GDP. It's quality, it's administration, the clothes, everything has influences our everyday life. The National Council of Educational Research and Training, NCERT, has denied accusations that its deletions are based on ideology. Its director, Professor Dinesh Prasad Saklani, said the removals were part of an unbiased rationalization process to ease the burden on Indian students some of the most stressed in the world. Rationalization would be that we remove a little bit of uh, information from each chapter and make each chapter a little shorter so that nothing is left out. But BJP leader Kapil Mishra sees the changes a little differently. 
It is a great decision to remove false history of Muggles from NCRT. Thieves, pickpockets and two penny road raiders were called the Mughal Sultanate and the Emperor of India. The effects of the British Empire continue to be a point of discussion here in India. And the country is now in the process of figuring out how it should look back on that era of colonisation. They gave India railways, cricket and bureaucracy. But now historians say that the British may have left India with much worse. The general consensus that the British would like to give you is that they were really good colonizers compared to, for example, the Belgians and the Congo. But when you actually look at the figures, you see that there were at least 50 million excess deaths in the period between 1880 and 1940. And some people say, in fact, it might have been even like 100 million. Recent analysis by economic historian Robert C. Allen suggests that extreme poverty in India more than doubled under the British, with real wages falling and famines increasing in frequency and severity. Some scholars say that at this period, the Indian life expectancy dropped to 22 years. 22, which is like, when you think about it, it's unbelievable. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall never surrender. And while Winston Churchill was leading the fight against the Nazis in World War II, experts now say he caused a massive famine in 1943 in Bengal, which produced a third of India's rice. With the Japanese invasion of neighbouring Burma, he introduced a scorched earth policy, destroying significant rice fields to deny Japanese invaders food supplies. And that's not all. There is no doubt that if not overtly, certainly covertly, he contributed to the death rate. Because he actually redirected and uh, stopped ships carrying produce to the Bengal Delta because he was scared that the Japanese in the Second World War would take over the ships. And he was not particularly empathetic to the population there. He didn't sort of really feel the need to rush in to try and save them. In her book, Churchill's Secret War, journalist Madhusri Mukherjee reported that the PM thought the Indian Army was useless. And the Secretary for India, Leo Amory, wrote in his diary, Churchill said sending relief would be no good, as Indians breed like rabbits anyway. I feel that Churchill was focused on the saving of the empire for Britain. He was not focused on the welfare or well-being of the colonial subjects. I mean, there is enough evidence in the war cabinet papers to show that. With the average daily ration of about 400 calories, the same as Buchenwald concentration camp prisoners, it's estimated that more than 3 million people died as a result. My parents were actually in Calcutta during the famine in 42, 43, and they experienced a kind of trauma that stayed with them till their deaths. My mother used to tell me the story of how there would be skeletal people in the street begging for the water drained from cooking rice, asking for starch water. Uh, how there would be uh, dead bodies that there were not enough people to cremate, which would just lie there. It had a terribly traumatic impact on them, and uh, they remembered it for the rest of their lives. And when other El Nino weather events caused more droughts, it's thought the East India Company and the British Raj maladministration resulted in millions of needless deaths. But despite a massive population increase, India hasn't experienced major famines since independence 75 years ago. The British have got off relatively lightly in terms of their colonial rule. And the reason I think for that is the way in which they have controlled the archives. And they have written the story of colonialism and it has been about education, trains, legal regimes. It has not been about hunger, famine, deindustrialization, immiseration. All of those have disappeared from their history books. The sari is one of the most recognisable South Asian pieces of clothing and women across the subcontinent continue to wear them. But each one has its own unique story. Should I even answer that question? I have over 150 saris. 
It's what's uh, called a Kashmiri embroidery. It's uh, very subtle, very appropriate for a uh, day wear and an evening wear. Uh, the girls and the women stopped wearing sari, um, and a large part of that was it was not considered cool to wear a sari. But I'm so glad now that it is coming back and it is uh, it is becoming uh, it is becoming cool to wear saris again. This sari is very special to me because this is my mum's sari. My mum, my grandmother, my aunties, everybody just wore saris day in day out. My collection is not very big, but each and every sari is a curated piece. In my imagination, this mountain need to kind of have a big collection of saris, at least a thousand of them, but I don't have space in my wardrobe. Each sari, it has a story. It's like a snapshot of special memories, events, and people. So the sari I'm wearing is my mom's sari. Uh, it's a cotton sari with a lot of print work done on it. I have no clue on when she got it and where she got it. I actually inherited it when she passed away um, in November. So it's a very pretty special sari for me. So the stories, they, they actually add flesh to the sari. And I think it adds meaning to, to when I wear a sari to know that yes, there is a story behind this sari that I'm wearing today. The word sari comes from the Sanskrit word that means a strip of cloth. As far as I know, uh, saris have been worn in India for, for uh, you know, eons. It dates back to the times of the Indus Valley civilization. Uh, way before Alexander the Great invaded India, uh, even before the Mughals invaded India. Saris obviously have revolutionized the way we live, the way we drape, the way we present and the way we interact in our social uh, communities. I have been wearing saris since like uh, I was a teenager. The first sari I ever got, which was truly mine, was my wedding sari, which was 24 years ago. And that was the first sari uh, I got. It is very traditional when a girl gets married that uh, the in-laws and your parents give a set of saris, a set of clothes. So I got around uh, 10 saris from my mother-in-law and 10 saris from my mum. Now I treasure it a lot um, because it was a gift and a symbol of the new life I was going to be, uh, I was going to have. Um, so that's the first sari I had. Um, I remember vividly the color of the sari was like a sea green color. And I uh, that was a special day for me. I was um, getting graduated. I can wear this masterpiece any time in my life, on any occasion. I do have one sari which is very precious to me, which is from my grandmother. It is in tatters, uh, literally, because silk saris, you know, they, they actually degenerate over a period of time. Um, but I still have kept it. Um, and uh, I've kept it just to show to, uh, if my son ever gets married, to show to his wife or his partner, uh, to say, well, this is the sari that is, belongs to your ancestors. The saris have also sort of grown and modernized in terms of the fabric, in terms of the weaves, in terms of the choices of the colors and the work that has been done. Depending on the type of sari that I wear, I feel that the sari has a profound effect on bringing a different personality in me. I've noticed that the different colors mean or give me a real profound feeling of strength, resilience, or empowerment. India has now overtaken France as the biggest buyer of Scotch whiskey. So what is driving the love affair here in the country? The Scottish dram may not be the first thing you think of when it comes to India, but the subcontinent has long loved the tipple. In fact, Indian whisky drinkers often enjoy the fabled Patiala Peg, named after the larger-than-life Maharaja of Patiala. That's two fingers, around four standard measures, which is 120 millilitres. And that love has grown even more with India's whisky consumption exploding by 200% over the last 
over the last decade, overtaking France as the world's second biggest market for scotch by volume. The markets have opened up. It's very trendy to drink a lot of liquor. When I was in Bangalore, there was a bar culture coming up in the city. And um, I think that kind of changed things eventually. And it's, it's, it's very common for people to have alcohol in India now. Despite alcohol being forbidden by many Indian religions and being banned in PM Narendra Modi's home state of Gujarat, Scotch whisky has actually grown tremendously over the last 10 to 12 years because of two primary reasons. One would be the travelling of Indians has increased phenomenally. What used to be an international visit once in a year has now become more frequent. But also they have started to realise that there is a fundamental difference in the way the whisky tastes what single malt scotch offers compared to what's available in India. While scotch was a mainstay of the British club, locals didn't initially warm to it. But after the westernised Indian elite started drinking whisky to emulate their British rulers, perhaps to curry favour, scotch was suddenly seen as prestigious, sophisticated and modern. Especially in Bollywood movies from the 1970s on, presenting whisky as glamorous and drinkers as macho. Bagpiper. But although many Indian whiskies like Bagpiper, Royal Stag, 100 Pipers or McDowell's sound Scottish, they're not. They're actually Indian made foreign liquor, local spirits usually made from molasses, sometimes blended with actual scotch and bottled in India to overcome massive 150% tariffs on imported liquor. Since Brexit, the British government has been trying to negotiate a new free trade agreement to increase Scotch's market share, arguing it could bring a potential 340 billion rupee increase in tax revenue. But a new wave of premium Indian single malts appealing to Indian palates is gaining popularity with younger drinkers who don't have the same colonial preconceptions that imported brands are better than Indian ones. I have tried Indian single malts uh, like Amrut and uh, Paul John and I think they're great, they're fantastic. The barley which is grown in India is different from the one grown in Scotland. So that has its own distinctive flavor. And the, finally the climatic conditions have a huge bearing on how the whiskey, when you, we are maturing it, how it reacts to the, the cask. But Indian whiskey manufacturers are concerned at the effect the removal of tariffs will have on the fledgling Indian single malt industry. We are not against the free trade agreements. All we say is that free trade agreements should be fair and equitable to both sides, and they should create opportunities for both sides. As a consumer, I don't go for it. I mean, I can't imagine as to what kind of acceleration India will have when there are many more variants, many more available brands from the single malt scotch whiskey that are available in India. The potential is incredible, given scotch is only 2% of the total Indian market. Why would an Indian whiskey industry or Indian alcohol industry want to reduce tax and lose market share? It just doesn't make sense. That's not the only sticking point. Due to India's much warmer climate, Indian whiskies mature three to three and a half times faster than Scottish ones. There is a UK definition as per the EU Act 2019, which makes it necessary for a whisky to be matured for three years to be qualified as a whisky. But the problem is the whisky evaporates. So if you unnecessarily force a whisky to be matured in Indian conditions, where actually the rate of evaporation is 10% year by year, which means your 30% of the whisky has evaporated. Although this bottleneck in negotiations may scotch any immediate change to the world's biggest whisky market, the rise of Indian single malt promises more choice for whisky connoisseurs around the world. And I can drink to that. Indian food is known for its spices, but did you know that one of the most distinctive spices here in the country has a secret that even a lot of locals don't know about? This 
is one of India's most distinctive ingredients, responsible for giving a lot of Indian food its flavour. To Indian cooks, it's called hing. To Westerners, asafoetida. And the Germans call it Teufelsdreck. And it's also known as devil's dung, which gives you an idea of its key feature. Despite the smell, it's an essential ingredient. It does a similar job to onion and garlic, which are prohibited for religious reasons by many communities, including strict Hindus, Buddhists and Jains. The spice is made by drying the resin from the Ferula asafoetida, a wild fennel that grows in cool, dry mountainous regions of Central Asia. Reportedly brought to the subcontinent by Alexander the Great, it's hard to grow in India with its much warmer and more human climate. But the Indian Council of Scientific and Industrial Research is now cultivating hing in the Indian Himalayas. Scientists are confident, but they face a number of challenges. Ferula asafoetida grows dormant in harsh conditions, takes years to flower, and local farming won't get close to the quantities required for all of India. But if efforts are successful, they could save over a hundred million dollars in imports a year. It's incredible that an ingredient so essential to Indian cuisine isn't grown in India. <laughs>